Okay. Uh, Rochelle and I, uh, our book was Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History by Mikel Rofe Trio. Um, could be pronouncing that wrong, even though I took French for at least 12 years, but it's fine. We won't focus on that. Um, instead, uh, the book was originally published in 1995 by Beacon Books. Uh, 20 years later, it was, pub uh, was printed again uh, in 2015 as like an anniversary printing. Um, the author himself was a professor of anthropology and social studies at the University of Chicago. Uh, he actually has a PhD in anthropology or had, and he was a, uh, a Haitian academic. He was actually from Haiti. Um, he published a lot of academic and non-academic texts about Haiti, focusing on history and questioning it and questioning how it's produced and how it works. Uh, the main arguments uh, were history is created in an unequal fashion. So not everyone's voices, viewpoint, viewpoints, or narratives get to be told with equal attention. Um, history is ambiguous. So history is created and recreated every time we try to interpret it, every time we think about it, we get different, uh, um, we get different meanings from it. And Facts are always up to interpretation. Facts are not necessarily facts. It really depends you know, how you're viewing something, what power structures are at play, whose voices are being represented in the narrative. Um, commemorations are very powerful. Uh, in the instance of Columbus, let's say, um, he has been commemorated huge celebrations throughout history and these celebrations validate you know what the citizens think of him they tell the, they tell the citizens what to think and they validate like yes that is the correct way to think about this person and of course that creates silences and those silences can appear anywhere they can appear in commemorations they can appear in the process of history which involves the making of sources archives narratives and history itself um, archival power has to do once again with, with facts. Like what, what is the archive telling us the facts are? Are those really the facts? Um, and is there any difference between what happened versus what is said to have happened? You know, like we're looking at the facts, we know what was said to have happened. Is that what really happened? Or are there silences here? And then, um, quick explanation of some of the chapters. So the preface um, basically is history is created by the winners. This leads to silences and inequalities in representation. Um, you can expose those inequalities with a critical eye. And chapter one focuses on the Alamo, um, which lots of people learned about in history class, probably back in middle school, I'm sure. Um, the history of the Alamo is believe it or not, somewhat ambiguous and filled with silences. Was the whole event the US kicking people off their land? Or was it the story of freedom fighters standing up to the dictator? You know, it, it depends which way you're looking at it. And then chapter two focuses on the Haitian Revolution and sans souci. Um, sans souci can be a French phrase, meaning without worry or care. Um, in this case, it is more a reference to Colonel Sansosi, who was a freedom fighter. And because he would not defect and go to the French side, he was killed and then completely erased from history. Chapter three uh, talks about how the Haitian revolution was viewed as impossible by Europe, by people in the West, how people were like, oh, that couldn't happen. And their reasoning for that was sort of through racist uh, racist thoughts and, ex and explanations like, oh, those people couldn't have revolted in Haiti because they have no means to organize. They're not intelligent enough. It must have been other people that incited it in them or helped them in some way. In fact, countries started even blaming each other. 
Um, so chapter four um, goes a lot into Columbus and Columbus has come to mean whatever is convenient throughout history. Nationalist symbol for the US and Spain. He was whitewashed and told the people who, who they were and the commemorations just legitimized it. Only recently have we taken another look at history to see who he really was and what he really stood for. And I think one of the most common things you can see, especially right now, is during Columbus Day, um, in some areas it has now come to be known as Indigenous Peoples Day or Native American Day um, or insert tribe here day, uh, just depending on what area you're in. Um, chapter five is more again. Uh, so he goes how to best represent and remember and confront racism in a way that doesn't accuse people who never own slaves. By confronting racism in our present day and seeing how it connects to our past, we fight in the today. Don't feel guilty about it, but make sure you understand that there is this white supremacist setting and in, ingrained in all of us. Um, and then the epilogue, he goes into, sometimes the archives let us see all the context, but they usually don't. What they don't show is just as important as what they do. We can use archives to understand the past facts and reinterpret them. This is the power of the archive uh, to show us what we're intended to focus on and let us decide if we still want to or not. So the theoretical basis so there were, a, there were a couple things I think that really stood out um, for some of the theories is the strategy of power. And he does, Trio does mention Foucault yeah, uh, pretty early in the book. Um, and he uses the quote, the way in which powers exercise and functions in society is little understood. And Trio takes this a lot further. He talks about um, the different strategies of power and the different areas of the silences that really play into our history. Uh, so the making of sources, archives, narrative, and the history of the final instance, like that's all that he goes into. Um, so Truyo also mentions Foucault gives us a warning. Um, I don't believe that the question of who exercises power can be solved unless that other question is how does it happen? Um, how does this, this power come into everything uh, and play into the silences? And then another Another theory that stood out was constructivism. And so constructivism is an approach to learning that holds that people actively construct or make their own knowledge that reality is determined by the experiences of the knower. And this is one of those, <laughs> I think it's, there's a lot of things that we can see when say coming to Columbus as my partner mentioned earlier, um, and the facts that are distorted around that. We build history that's not completely true. Like there are, there is a basis in reality, but was Columbus the, <laughs> the discoverer or the conqueror? Did he invade? Because <laughs> We have whitewashed him so much, it's extremely distorted. Back in week four, Green had an article that talked about social justice as an archival imperative. Um, now he was, Green was more going over his arguments for it and against it and what he sees it as. It as. Um, but in this, Trio shows social justice is giving a voice to the silence and making sure that we know more of the truth, such as Starn's article, Truth in Archives. Um, and again, going back to Columbus, Trio really dives into the October 12th, 1492, 
and how that date isn't as concrete and simple as we like to believe it. Uh, and then the invasion or discovery of Columbus landing in the quote unquote new world. Um, and another is just so realize how history impacts us and the silences that it does cause and the silences that aren't equal. Uh, it just goes to show like in reading it, how the silencing of San Susi the man was more intentional than it was unintentional. And as Hazel V. Carby, she wrote the foreword for the 20th anniversary edition says, what history matter, what history is matters less to, to Trio than how history works. Um, so, Rochelle, I just wanted to add in that um, the social justice as an archival imperative and truth in the archives, that can be related to multiple parts in the book. Um, it could be related to the Alamo, it could be related mm -hmm. to the whole Haitian Revolution and Sun So oh, sure. What is the truth doesn't necessarily, you know, it, the truth is very, very hard to define. So <laughs> just because the archives say it's one way doesn't necessarily mean it is. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the reception and impact. Um, this book had an immense amount of citations on Google Scholar. It had tons of mentions uh, through open syllabus. And as far as academic reviews went, um, we actually couldn't find too, too many. Um, uh, Seepenwall was one of the main ones that I chose to focus on. And uh, this picture is actually of her. She is a professor at, well, a history professor at the University of California. And her and Greg, another reviewer, have very positive opinions and think that this book is very empowering and encourages others to look at other historical narratives for silences and to also look at their own lives and to see how the ideas that tr Trio mentions, how they fit with us and with who we are on a personal level. Um, also Knight was the one negative reviewer. He was not a fan. Um, he didn't really understand the relationship between the events chosen. Uh, he, he was more looking for a definition of what history is and a criticism of historiography, which wasn't really what the book was about. So um, I know both of us really disagreed with what he said. Um, we, sure. we, yeah, yeah we, we agreed more with what Seepenwall and Greg said because like we both really feel that this is kind of, it's kind of like a call to, it's, it's a call to be wary of history by knowing how it's created, to just not, you know, to, to question more things instead of just accepting them and to realize that there is inequality in history and it can be from racism. It isn't always, but it can be. And if you want to essentially combat that, you need to think about how it affects our lives in the now with the contextual framing of the past. Uh, did you have anything to add, Rochelle? No, I really enjoy the book and encourage people, if they want, to take a look at it, give it a read or a listen. It is on Audible. Um, and the dude has a relatively soothing voice that's reading it, so that's helpful. <laughs> All right. Um, and then just, we had quite a few references, so just the references. And um, I believe we are done. Yes? Yes. 